push the button of the registration as soon as Emilio will start. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, thank you, Rocco, Georgia, Silvia, and everybody for inviting me to participate in this doctoral summer school. It's a great pleasure. It's a pity we cannot be together in person uh, since this, this kind of schools uh, are a, an excellent opportunity for interaction with the students and the uh, uh, other professors. But uh, at the same time, it is, it is also great uh, that we can manage to, to do this and to have this online. Uh, so thank you, uh, Rocco and all the organizers for letting me participate in this uh, school. Uh, as it has been said, my name is Emilio Cano, Dr. Emilio Cano. I work at the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC, in an institute dedicated to metallurgical research, the National Center for Metallurgical Research, the uh, CENIM. And, um, I, I have, uh, I am the head of a research group dedicated within this institute, uh, which covers all fields, fields related with metallurgy. My research group is specifically dedicated and fully dedicated to the study, uh, to the conservation, and to the understanding, the analysis of metallic cultural heritage. And today I am going to talk um, very briefly, because this is a matter that might take uh, uh, quite a long time, but just as an introduction to a technique, which is uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, which is probably not known by most of you. It's a technique that it is quite specific for metallic uh, artifacts or metallic materials, but I, as, that I will try to show within in the next minutes that can give you some information that cannot be obtained by any other means. So why are we um, dealing with, with uh, this kind of techniques? Well, um, corrosion, it's not the only cause of deterioration of metallic cultural heritage, but it is the main one. Corrosion, when we have, uh, is something that happens everywhere and uh, when we have a metallic artifact, a metallic object of every kind, but of course, if it is a, a metallic heritage, this object is this not in the vacuum, it is within some environment, which can be an outdoor environment, can be an indoor environment within a museum or a burial environment. In any kind of environment, there's an interaction between the metallic material, and as a result of that, we have corrosion and we have, at the end, we have a corroded object. Well, these are some examples that I have taken of different environments, uh, a sample of an archaeological artifact which has corroded uh, during burial. Uh, we have this uh, Peine del Viento, which as you can see is heavily corroded because it's exposed to the, to the seaside or some other artifacts like this one, which is a, a lead weight exposed in a museum, which is also heavily corroded by the vapors released by the materials used in these um, display cases. To study this phenomenon, we have many techniques. Uh, in general, to study metallic heritage, we, of course, being a cultural heritage, we have to assess the aesthetic and historic values, and we have different means by visual inspection or historical sources. We might be interested in characterizing or knowing the composition microstructure, and we have many analytical techniques. Some of them are being presented during this school, such as XRF, RAM, and XRD, LIB, CTC, many analytical techniques that give us a lot of information of different aspects. But if we want to study directly the corrosion process, the best techniques we have are electrochemical techniques. This is for the following reason. Um, electrochemical corrosion is the main type of corrosion that we find in cultural heritage. Other types of corrosion, uh, dry corrosion or chemical corrosion is, is uh, well, uh, I usually try to avoid saying 
that we never found this because there can be a very specific case in which it can be relevant for cultural heritage. But as a general uh, rule, we all, uh, in all cases, the type of corrosion we see for cultural heritage is the type uh, of the electrochemical type. That means that this reaction, this anodic and cathodic reaction taking place on the surface of the metal are taking place within um, an electrolyte layer. This electrolyte layer can be um, uh, the water if it is submerged or can be a layer of adsorbed water that is attached to the surface of the metal in uh, atmospheric uh, environment. In this, in, in, in the, within this electrolyte layer, we have anodic reactions, which are the oxidation of the metal, and we have cathodic reactions, mainly uh, the uh, reduction of oxygen, which yield different uh, charged species that react and uh, form the corrosion product. And if we look at these, at these reactions, we see that we have, as I said, charged species, ions and electrons that are moving within this system. And um, this at the end causes uh, electrical current. So if we can measure or control this movement of a species, uh, we can control or measure directly the corrosion process. And that is what is made by the electrochemical techniques. These techniques have many advantages for measuring the, the corrosion. Um, a very relevant one is that uh, these techniques are extremely uh, sensitive. They have a very high sensitivity. Sensibility, sorry. Uh, so for instance, if we want to measure uh, a corrosion process of the oxidation of iron to iron uh, plus two during one uh, hour that is produced by one nanoampere per centimeter uh, per square centimeter, which is a, an intensity that sounds low, but it is easily, very, quite easily measured by, by uh, common uh, laboratory equipment. This, uh, that electrochemically can be measured quite easily, produces a change of mass of only 10 nanograms, which is uh, extremely difficult to measure. So this is one of the advantages, the high sensibility. Another advantage, a very important advantage is that can measure the instantaneous corrosion rate. Um, we do not measure the accumulated corrosion over a long time, but we can measure it um, instantaneously at different times during the, the corrosion process. And in some cases, in some cases, we will talk about this a bit uh, later, can be non-destructive. So we can measure the evolution of, pot of protection uh, or, or protection system or the corrosion over time. We can also measure real conditions. We do not need to take the object, the sample to um, to, 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 to a microscope or to uh, another analytical technique. And this is, we know this is very important in our case in which we need to measure on real objects, on real artifacts that cannot be moved. And finally, it is relatively simple and inexpensive equipment, uh, mainly if we compare with other analytical techniques. If any of you come from the field of or have studied conservation restoration, might have heard about these techniques as tools for restoration treatments. They were very popular. The best first works were by Francis Rathgen at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century in, in Germany. They became very popular for treatment of metals in the mid 20th century. The, the famous book, uh, Conservation of Works of Art by Plenderleith, uh, reporting many examples of the use of these techniques. However, due to the change in corrosion, uh, sorry, in, in, in conservation criteria and conservation ethics, they, their use declined in the 70s uh, and became, uh, well, they were mostly disregarded these techniques at the end of the 20th century. However, there has been an increase in new interest with the beginning of this uh, 21st century. Uh, due to different uh, refinements of the techniques for the conservation that allowed uh, a better control of the process. On the other side, if we look at uh, 
research corrosion, research laboratories, these techniques are very, very much uh, popular, very, very, very popular, and, and probably are the main techniques used for a characterization of corrosion processes and, and protection systems. However, uh, until very few years ago, these techniques have not been widely used for studies, for this kind of studies of corrosion and protection systems, specifically for metallic cultural heritage, for many reasons uh, that, uh, well, that, that has been mostly addressed in the last years. You may have noticed that I have said electrochemical techniques in plural, and it is because um, there are many, many types of or, or, uh, variants of these techniques. We have, in all cases, we are dealing with the same parameters. We are dealing with the voltage, uh, with the potential E. We are uh, dealing uh, or, or working with the intensity of the corrosion, uh, I, and we are working and dealing with the time. And depending on how we combine the these parameters, which ones we control and apply and which one we measure, we have different techniques. We have polarization resistance, polarization core voltammetries, uh, potential static or government static techniques. But one of the most, or uh, I would dare to, to, to say that it is probably the most popular one is electrochemical impedance spectroscopy that is better known by the acronym EIS in, in English. So I will focus on this technique, um, which is based, as you can see in this slide, the application of a signal of alternating current. We apply uh, uh, an alternating current signal in we uh, change the, the, the frequency we are applying and we up, uh, make a frequency swept typically from 100 kilohertz or, or 1000 kilohertz down to 10 or 1 millihertz, depending on, the, uh, on what are we measuring. We apply that signal in response to that uh, potential signal, we also have uh, an intensity response of our system. Our system, which is in our case, our metallic sculpture, our metallic object. And the relationship between this signal we apply and the response we obtain is the uh, impedance, which is the analogous in, in alternating current to the resistance uh, the, uh, in, in, uh, in direct current. And by doing this in these different frequencies, we obtain the so-called uh, EIS spectra, which is the representation of the impedance of the system at the different frequencies we have measured. What we obtain from this spectra is, uh, generally speaking, the electrochemical behavior of our system. And since one, or not the only one, but probably the most important electrochemical process that are taking place on the surface of our metal, are corrosion processes, we obtain direct information on these electrochemical processes. The typical ACE spectra can be presented in different ways, but the most typical ones are the so-called Bow diagrams and Nyquist diagrams. In the Bow diagram shown here in the left, we represent the modulus of the impedance and the phase angle of the impedance versus the frequency. And this is the typical aspect you can you can see. Um, on the Nyquist uh, diagram on the right side, we represent the imaginary part of the impedance versus the uh, real part of the impedance. And each again, each point represents a different frequency, although in this Nyquist uh, diagram is not uh, um, explicitly uh, represented here in, in, in any scale, but each point corresponds to a different frequency. So the information shown here in both diagrams are the same, actually, and depending on the process, depending on our system, sometimes uh, it is better or more clear to use one of the other. But the, what I want you to, to keep in mind is that the information is in any case the same, and uh, the treatment we do is exactly the same regardless of the representation we use. For the interpretation of these results, um, 
I have to say that this is probably the trickiest part of this technique, and it's, it's one of the disadvantages uh, it has. The petition is quite complex, and extracting the information of what is happening here from this spectra is time consuming and takes some experience and knowledge on both the technique and the system you are analyzing. There are different techniques for analyzing the data, but the most popular one is the use of the uh, so-called equivalent circuits. These equivalent circuits, which take this form of an electrical circuit, what we have are different elements that represent different parts or different components of our uh, corroding uh, system, our, uh, our system. These equivalent circuits can be as complex as you can imagine. And actually one of the main problems is that in theory, uh, mathematically, there are infinite equivalent circuits that can fit to your data. But uh, we can, um, uh, by using these, these, these circuits, and typically there are uh, few one general equivalent circuits that can explain different systems. As an example, here in the left, I am showing a very simple one, which represents the behavior of uh, a metallic electrode immersed in, a, in an electrolyte. And we have uh, our resistance of the electrolyte in the far left part. Uh, let me see if I can take the uh, pointer. Yeah, here you can see the uh, resistance of the electrolyte, which is uh, uh, it's of the electrolyte we are using. And we have here in parallel two elements which represent the, uh, the behavior of the corroding metal. We have in the top part um, a capacitor which represents the uh, capacitance of the la double layer or, uh, of the, that is formed on the surface of the metal. And in the bottom, we have a charge transfer resistance which represents the, uh, which is related with the charge transfer occurring for the uh, reduction or the oxidation of the different species on the surface. Typically, the uh, oxygen reaching the surface and being uh, reduced and the metal that is being oxidized. When we have a coated metal, we have a slightly different system. Um, in the right, you can see here, the top in this part, we have a typical uh, equivalent circuit for a uh, coating with, uh, with for a good coating. Again, we have a very similar, well, actually similar um, circuit, but differs the interpretation of these elements. In this case, the capacitance corresponds or to the capacitance of formed by the metal, the electrolyte, and the coating itself, and depends on uh, parameters such as the thickness of the coating and the uh, the electric properties of the coatings, and the uh, resistance here corresponds to the resistance uh, for passing uh, of the electrical signal through the pores uh, of the coating. When this coating is damaged, we have a slightly more complex equivalent circuit in which we have, uh, again, the, the resistance of the pores and the capacitance of the a polymer or the or the coating, or, um, but we have inside in the bottom of this pore, um, we have in series another uh, capacitance and resistance which correspond again to the double layer and the charge transfer resistance here. It is in this case this part is equivalent to this part in the circuit in the left. This uh, I don't want to go deeper into this. It is probably too complex and, uh, and and it would take a long time to explain at least the even the, the most basic application of this equivalent sequence. But I just wanted here to show this uh, tool that is used for interpretation. And I just want you to keep in mind that this uh, tool, this equivalent sequence, the different elements here represent different elements in the in, in, in our system. And by analyzing independently all these elements, 
we can analyze independently, independently different elements of our uh, system that we are uh, that we are uh, studying. Well, uh, coming to the experimental setup, this is the typical electrochemical cell we used for carrying out this kind of uh, this, this kind of, of analysis. It is a three electrode electrochemical cell. It is typically a, a, a vessel in which we put three electrodes. The working electrode is the material we want to uh, um, we want to study. Uh, here it can be a coated metal or the metal we want to to study. We, we use a reference electrode for measuring the the potential, um, which is typically a saturated column electrode or a silver silver chloride electrode. This is a a, a reference uh, electrode that we use to measure against it the potential. And we have finally uh, the so-called counter electrode, which is an inert electrode to close the circuit and to apply the signal. We do not want to apply our signal through the reference electrode. We, we can damage it or polarize it in, in, in having a wrong potential. So we use for that uh, an external electrode, which is uh, typically a platinum, graphite, or stainless steel uh, layer or, or grid. We connect that to the potential stat, galvanostat. This is, uh, you can see here, the one, one of the, the, the ones we use here. This is the uh, small box with some cables we connect. And we control that through, uh, by means of the uh, a computer. So you see, this is, not, this is all the equipment we have. If you compare that with a more sophisticated uh, equipment, it is quite simple. Of course, it has. Uh, high precision electronics in it, and it is not um, well uh, very cheap. It is not cheap as a computer, but it is uh, more simple than other techniques. And using this setup, and now yeah, uh, now coming into direct samples, real samples of application for cultural heritage. The first applications I am aware of uh, of this technique of electrochemical impedance for cultural heritage is this work by uh price and hallam and, and and that was presented in the icom cc metal conference in 95 uh, in which they used this immersion cell for the evaluation of different wax coatings for protection of metallic uh, heritage you can see in the right the scheme taken from this uh from the uh, proceedings of this conference in which you see the same scheme I have uh, already presented. And the same, uh, the same people, the same group, the, David Hallam and, and co-workers presented much later, uh, another similar um, study, in, in this case, studying the protective properties of oils, of lubricant oils for uh, iron, for, um, for steel. And you can see this is uh, the same scheme. This is uh, a vessel, and you can see it gives a slightly different arrangement of the electrode, but again, the, the three electrode, the, the, the working electrode here, the coated uh, steel electrode, a counter electrode, which is this platinum uh, mesh, and the, here you see the saturated caramel electrode, which is the reference electrode. But you can see that this device can be helpful for some studies, but you have to immerse your uh, the sample you want to measure, which is not very convenient in all cases. Um, so another type of cell is this one. It is the, the so-called flat cell in which we keep the same elements, but we arrange them in a slightly different way. In this case, our working electrode is this flat um, sheet. Uh, um, you can see here the, the blue one. And what we have is this vessel that can be placed horizontally or vertically, doesn't really matter, in which we put the electrolyte and it is open in this end, leaving the working electrode, our uh, flat sample exposed to the electrolyte. And then we put again here the, uh, uh, the counter electrode and the reference electrode. In the right here, you, you can see the, the arrangement we used uh, in our lab for a project some time ago. Here, this is the uh, 
the, the sheet of steel that has been coated, and we wanted to, to test and their reference at the counter electrode. And using this setup, we measured uh, within a European project, PROMET, in which we tested different coatings for metals. We tested different uh, coatings, and you can see in the left the bold uh, diagram. In this case, we have separated the uh, the phase angle and uh, the modulus of the of the impedance, um, and just looking at, at a very simple interpretation, you can see here that the values of the modulus in these intermediate frequencies is very different for the different coatings, and uh, as a general rule, the higher the impedance, the lower is the current that is passing through our system. And therefore, it means that the lower is the uh, corrosion we are having. And that means that in this case, in this image, the coatings 2A and 2B that corresponds to polygen coating uh, with the addition of an inhibitor uh, have a much higher two, three orders of magnitude, higher uh, impedance than the bare uh, steel without coating or to the other coatings. And that means that the protective properties of these coatings are much higher than the others. And in this way, we can compare the, uh, the protective properties of different coatings. Well, and um, now you might be thinking and that we have mentioned previously that we can measure in real conditions and even on real objects. So some of you might be wondering, how can we do this with this experimental setup that I have already shown? How can we take a real sculpture like this one in, in, in Mexico, and how can we take this and put that into our electrochemical cell? We would need a, a swimming pool instead of a, of a bezel. Of course, the solution is not, in this case, uh, it is not the solution is not to make a bigger cell. But uh, if we cannot take the sculpture to the cell, what we do is do the other way around and to take our cell to the sculpture. And this approach, specifically for cultural heritage, was the approach taken by uh, an Italian researcher, Paola Letardi from CNR Genoa, in which um, she applied this idea of the flat cell but instead of using a vessel for containing the electrolyte, um, she replaced this vessel with a cloth that was impregnated with the electrolyte and uh, keeping the reference electrode and the counter electrode in contact with this cloth impregnated in, in the electrolyte and all this in contact with the working electrode, we have our whole system that it's on the end, a reference, a counter, and a working electrode, which are in contact through an electrolyte. And using this, um, this, this idea, she designed what she called the contact cell, which you can see in the, in the right. This is a small um, cylinder, well, a few, some cylinders embedded in uh, the floor holders and with connections for the cables you see uh, they are made of, of stainless steel, of um, IC316 uh, stainless steel. You see here this dot, this small uh, circle in the middle is acts uh, as a reference electrode. The outside ring, the outside bottom of the cylinder exposed to the metal is the counter electrode. And what she did was to cover it with this here, you can see this cloth. And by keeping this a tail of this cloth immersed in a, in a vessel containing the electrolyte, you can keep a wet surface and apply that to the surface of the sculpture or the real work of art we, uh, we want to measure. And, these are some real examples of the work of, of Paola. And some of you might identify the one in the, in the bottom right. This is a work that she did with uh, Opificio e Betredure for the restoration of the doors of the, baptis of the baptistry of, of, of Florence, um, comparing different coatings. In, and you can see here, it is 
I don't know if I can, yeah. Here, in the bottom, it is this cell applied to a surface in which the restorers had applied different coatings and we're comparing uh, them. So this was, a, a, I would say that this is the pioneering work and I always recognize the work by Paola because she was the first person who developed this specifically for cultural heritage. You can see here, well, this is another example in, in a work we did in collaboration with Paola a couple of years ago, comparing different uh, measuring in this case, in, it is a contemporary sculpture made of stainless steel. There have been other approaches to, to this, and this is the, this is the work done by, by a group, uh, also Italian group uh, from Politecnico di Torino, uh, a group led by M. Angelini, and they used different approaches. One of them was this, the use of these uh, adhesive disks, foam disks, uh, to attach this uh, small container to the surface in which they put the electrolyte inside and using a uh, platinum uh, electrode as counter electrode. And using this system, they have measured, for instance, the, um, the, the impedance in, in the railings of uh, Palazzo Reale di Torino. And they have used this sorry, I'm going back, they have used this system using um, a liquid electrolyte. But the problem of using a liquid electrolyte using the system of any other or, or any other is that the electrolyte can leak. This kind of adhesive systems cannot adhere very well to rough surfaces or irregular surfaces. And at the end, if uh, it is very difficult to keep this electrolyte without having a leakage or of, of the electrolyte. Of course, you cannot measure upside down. It is a bit tricky to, to do this. So there have been some um, attempts to avoid the use of liquid electrolytes. And one of them was also by Angelini and, and, and co-workers. Um, and in this example, they use electrocardiograms uh, electrodes, the, the ones that are used for, for medical studies. And, uh, um, and they were uh, able to measure the, the impedance of the surface. And you can see in the right, the uh, modulus of the impedance. You can see that again, they, they have been able to measure the impedance of different areas. With the, that have been cleaned by the restorers. The problem is, is that these results are not comparable to a traditional cell. So the interpretation is a bit, uh, well, let, let's say it's quite tricky. It is more than usual. And you can see if anybody that has done impedance look at this uh, result would say that there are some inflection points that are very strange and probably difficult to, uh, to understand. This is basically due to the uh, low conductivity of the, uh, let me, of these electrodes. And this is something that has already been recognized and studied by, um, by this group. And they demonstrated using this kind of simulation that depending on the conductivity of the surface of the metal and the paint uh, or the coating or the, or, or, or the patina applied to that, the area you are studying is different. And this can also change um, with, the, uh, with the frequency you are, you are applying. So that could explain the different, this strange results. And also they also have highlighted the difficulty to adapt to rough surfaces because it cannot adapt and fill all these gaps in, 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 a, in a rough surface. So you don't really know which is the real surface you are analyzing. Following a similar approach, uh, another uh, group in the United States, Tammy Clare, uh, led by Tammy Clare, has used a, a similar approach using hydrogel electrodes. In this case, the idea is similar, but they synthesize their own hydrogels to, they said, to have a better control um, of the system. And what is more interesting, uh, more from from my point of view, more than the, the electrodes they used, that they propose instead of using this system in which we have in the, shown in the left, in which we have uh, to make electrical contact with the working electrode, we have to attach a cable to the metal to be able to measure. Um, 
they propose to use a system in which they apply two electrodes in parallel, a working electrode and a counter electrode on the top of the uh, coating. And in this way, you do not need to make a, an electrical connection to the metal. The idea is that the current will flow this, uh, this path through the coating, through the metal, and then again through the coating to reach the counter electrode. And in this way, you uh, you can measure, actually you're measuring twice the coating because the impedance of the metal is uh, negligible and, and you can just disregard that. The problem of this system, from my point of view, is that there are two main problems. Three, let's say three. Uh, one is that you cannot use a real reference electrode. You, can, you need to measure with two electrodes. We have some uh, disadvantages. There also might also be problems of current distribution, specifically uh, when you have a low impedance coating, uh, which is the typical case of many coatings used in cultural heritage, you can also have current flowing through the coating as shown here by these uh, arrows. So at the end, you don't know what are you really measuring. And finally, a very relevant problem is that you have limited options for choosing the electrolyte. And why this, this is important, if, if I come back to this slide, you might remember this, uh, that we are saying that this metal is corroding in a given environment. This is very important, this is a very critical idea. Corrosion, we cannot, we can never talk about corrosion of a material. We have always to talk about corrosion of a given material in a given environment because the processes can be completely different and the behavior of the metal can be absolutely different. There are metals that corrode very heavily in some environments and that remain passive or, um, or, or uh, inert in other different environments. So it is critical to be able to control the environment in which we want to test the, the sample. So if we want to study the behavior of a given heritage artifact, we need- Sorry, Emilio, may yeah. I just recall you that you have three minutes left. Three? Thank you, yes. So, okay, we have to rush very much. I will skip this part. I, I, was, I thought I had a bit more for this. I just want to show you that we, have developed, uh, taking all this into account, we have developed a system, uh, a gel polymer electrolyte cell, which wanted to avoid all these problems that I have lighted. We wanted to avoid liquids, to avoid the problems we handle in a liquid electrolyte. We want also to have it uh, to be economic and easy to prepare. We do not want to, to have very complicated recipes or systems. From the electrochemical point of view, we needed to use different electrolytes and we want to have to be able to have results comparable to a traditional cell. That means using a three electrode cell. And from the point of view of conservation, of course, we want to be sure that it respects the work that is adaptable to the real life of different uh, surfaces and geometries and that leave no residues. This is the what we have developed. This is the, the, the system we are using this. It is basically the idea of having a liquid electrolyte and jellify it with agar. Agar or agarose, uh, we have studied different combinations, different uh, gelling agents, different electrodes, counter electrodes, or different geometries. This has been the uh, PhD thesis of my colleague Blanca Ramirez. And you have here some uh, reference. If you are interested in this, you can uh, go through, through this. Um, since I will have to skip some of them, I will send to Rock or a PDF of the presentation so you can have all these references. We have used that for measuring uh, in the laboratory. Uh, you can see this example in which we used this technique for measuring in previous Hyperion projects on bronze and silver coatings. And we were able to compare the performance of different coatings the performance of different application methods, for instance, you can see here the comparison of one or two layers of uh, solder wax or um, in, in different concentrations of different 
systems applying to uh, layers combining an acrylic coating with wax and to compare also these before and after artificial aging. Um, I cannot go into detail, but just looking at these, uh, the, the, the modules of the impedance, you can see that there are two orders of magnitude on the uh, performance of the different coatings. And you can also see, comparing the light blue and dark blue bars, how these performance changes. And sometimes it decreases, and sometimes, sometimes sorry, it increases after artificial aging. But of course, we have developed these for um, we have developed this for in situ measuring. And this is the example I am bringing you here is the study of these sphinxes in the uh, archaeological museum in, uh, in Madrid. We have compared during the restoration process, we have measured before and after the restoration process, which included uh, the cleaning and application of infralac, uh, of four layers of infralac plus uh, a wax. I will skip this. Um, we tested and we were sure that it left no residues on the uh, on the surface. You can see this spot on the left is just after removing. The surface is wet, of course, because we apply that on the surface. But after a few seconds, it is wet, and um, and it left no visible residues. And I have to say that after almost five years, there is no visible effect on, on, on that. And using these in two different uh, areas of the Sphinx, we have been uh, able to compare, for instance, the performance of the patina. In the, in the arm, the green patina is about five times more protective than the dark patina in the leg. But what is even more important, we have been able to measure the performance of this coating over time. So we measured that before treatment, before restoration, you see in the dark um, dots in the, in the diagram. And you see how after the application of the treatment, it goes up uh, and it is, um, uh, it is uh, uh, the, the maximum impedance we get, but at repeating after 5, 10, 16, and 23 months, we have seen how the performance of this coating is decreasing. So if we plot this against uh, time, we can see very clearly how this is decreasing. And we can anticipate that uh, it will fail in about uh, five, four years. Fortunately, we have not been able, due to the COVID, we have not been able to come back and measure if the, if the performance of the coating has reached the, uh, again the initial situation. But um, just wanted to show you this, that how can we follow this and see the degradation of the protective properties of the coating because before any actual damage to the surface is happening. I'm skipping this part of, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, also I, because al already your time, your 45 minutes are gone. So I know, so I am, it. yeah, I am concluding and just let me go here. We'll go just to the end. Just to say that if you are interested in this, you have it available in MOLAB. It is one of the services offered for transnational access in this project in Iperion HS. So you can go there and, 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 and choose this uh, for a MOLAB proposal if you want so. And I finished. Thank you for your attention and sorry for uh, running at the, uh, at the end. I, I didn't have my, my uh, watch here and I, I, I uh, forgot to to check the the time. Sorry about this. You, I, I am your I am your watch. <laughs>